It's four o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live, starring the only two minute late Rob Shirelli. Woo! Oh, yeah, there's the microphone. Thank you, Rob. <laughs> I almost wore my shirt today. I was hoping you would. <laughs> Whoa, stop. There we go. Hi, Rob. Welcome to the big show. Good to see you. So, uh. Glasses on. I look intelligent. Oh, yeah. That's the new look. Um, what do you guys think of the new the... look? <laughs> there he is. Hmm? So uh, I've got this shirt in orange, and Rob saw it and goes, where'd you get that, Lasco? So I sent him the link, and I, this morning I actually had mine in hand and was going to wear it. What's up with that? you got to represent. <laughs> and I thought, no, that would be too weird if for some reason we both showed up wearing the same shirt. So I wore a blue sweater, just in case anybody's wondering. Um... And, Let's see. how are you? Good, and you? I'm good, thanks. Let's go, let's get the show on the road. Well, we are. First, like. You want me to play a tune for you? Is that what you're waiting on? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday, dear Rob. Happy birthday to you. Excellent. Woo! Thank you. Thank you. 36 today. I never lie. I, about, I was going to say. I never you. lie about my age. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Hi, Charlie. <laughs> it's his fault we're late. <laughs> I already prepped the audience. The camera was all already on. We were rolling, and I was okay, saying, okay. Rob's never been on time for a show. So, Why well, change? Look <laughs> right. at how well they go. They go well, though, so hey. But, Charlie, when people show up late for band practice, how does that go? I don't say anything. Really? No. Wow. No, I'm, I'm, under, I'm in what they call, I'm an understanding guy. I, like, I know that there's, like, weather problems. <laughs> what have you done to my drives. friend Rob Shirelli? <laughs> Where you is know. he? I like, you know, I'm a kinder, gentler guy. Okay. Sort of. So, yeah. uh, scoot in just a pinch so we're both comfortably in the frame. I'm just, comfortable. Just, yeah, swing your butt. There you go. <laughs> anyway, hi, Rob. Hello, everybody. Let's see who we have there. Gloria Covington, Christo, Steven Spinner, Rusty Perez, Brenda Thompson, Andrew F., uh, Dell Johnston, uh, Wilton Vaught, Vaught, Derek, Ferdinand, Marion Laird, yeah, Mike Crisulo. Uh, okay, we will write you a song. Um, so anyway, uh, we are going to do audience Q and A today. Okay, we already got some it. questions sent to us. Um, from our friends on Facebook. By the way, we're giving away software later. We are giving away software later. Um, don't let us forget. I'm sure you guys won't. And I actually wrote down a Here's the code. I want to give it to him early. OK, did you get that? <laughs> They're all going to say, hold it up again. He will <laughs> later. Um, and also, uh, I have some specific questions that you and I are going to go over about panning. Let's do it. There's only three positions. Next question. <laughs> uh, well, first, let's take the audience member questions. But before Bria starts kicking me under the chair, I'm going to say, everybody out there, see that subscribe button? It's the red one down in the corner, in the right-hand corner. Click that subscribe button. Be a subscriber. Because we give money away to subscribers, um, like once every 100 years, I think. Share a link so that your friends and family members know. Ring the bell so you get alerts. That thing is huge. And then, like us. There you go. Okay, I've done my job. So, let's kick right in. So, yesterday was your actual birthday. Mm -hmm. um, and 36, wow. So that means you were one when I met you because you know what? We were together with our wives. Let's not go there, moving on. What's the first question? <laughs> Why? How long have we known each other? 30 no. years. We, I met you when you were a year old. Right. Right? Okay. Um, anyway, 
So Robert Else asks, Hi Rob, I'm writing and recording a lot of solo piano works in various styles on a good Steinway. Lucky you, Rob. Uh, Robert Else. Uh, I like the mics I'm using, Earthworks PM40s, but often wonder what processing a pro, uh, we should ask one, uh, would apply to. <laughs> Is there to. any in the run? <laughs> <Right? laughs> you get a great acoustic piano sound. Are there any general principles that would apply? Thank you. Well, if you have a great instrument and you do have great mics, then you're probably 90% of the way there. The other 50% is a great player, so let's make sure you have a great player. Got to have a big the touch, deal. right? Yeah. So, um, you know, I when I record acoustic instruments, I never compress it and I never EQ it. It's just... Um, I don't know, I think I've gotten a bit of a reputation around. Yeah, but that's not what it's for. Uh, yeah, a different <laughs> reputation. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, if you record it cleanly on a good instrument, um, there are a couple of different techniques. One is an XY over the hammers, if it's a grand. Is it a grand? Um, he doesn't say. Um, a good Steinway. Okay, let's assume it's a grand, So a baby grand or something. So over the keys, a little XY pattern over it, whoosh, you know. Um, that's, you know, st one standard approach. Another is, which I love, is to put um, an XY pair outside the open lid, which is a little bit more, um, it's a little wider image, it's a little mellower tone. So both of them are great, and um, just don't compress it and don't EQ it, and it should sound just like a piano. Um, I think I've probably told you this before, but if not, my, my favorite microphone for the top end of a grand piano, I assume it would work on an upright as well, is a lavalier mic. Almost huh. any lavalier will do it. I even once used it like a $20 Radio Shack lavalier. The reason is they've got a really nice bump at around 3K because they're made for voice. They're um, omnidirectional uh, and they're really rolled off on the bottom end. Huh. So I used cool. to take an 87 and put that over the bottom end and then just dangle by the wire from a mic stand a, a, a lavalier like right over the strings. It was shocking how good that sounded. So there's your $20 answer. Yeah, if you want the, the $60,000 answer, get a <laughs> pair of, or get a C24 and an 87, put it on the low <laughs> strings and a couple of tube 47s outside the, the open lid and that's... That's going to sound really good. But kidding aside, no, that's great. I mean, I love uh, Earthworks mics. and um, I've never used one. Yeah, Those they are, just, the natural really, sounding mics are really good. They used to use them to tune rooms. Uh, yeah. You'd get a pair of matched Earthworks microphones, and you would use them with the pink noise generator and mm -hmm. do all that stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, next question is from Jeff Pitcher. Um, hi, Rob. They're so nice. They're all saying, hi, Rob. Thanks for taking the time to answer our questions. Uh, what is the best source of instruction, tutorials, or other information for folks like me that write, mix, and master classical music and cues? I'm trying to understand in particular what processing and plugins work best for short, long strings, short slash long strings, short and long strings to produce a nice, subtle rasp. You know what? You know, I have never done in a classical recording. There are guys who are absolute masters at this, and they are real experts. And I would be lying if I told you how to do it. And one of the things that is my little, um, I'll call it a big kind of, you know, um, thorn, is that um, when I read on certain message blobs about, uh, <laughs> you know, folks giving advice on something that they have no experience in. So I, I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I'm just not the right guy to talk about classical music. I can talk about the music itself. I played in orchestras, but as a recording engineer, that's a separate art, I think, and I, I think I might want somebody else to... Uh, to help you with that. So, before we go any further, let's ask Michael. <laughs> I mean, I've, I just did a nice string section the other day, but it's not classical. 
Classical is a different a different thing, right? So I've got to tell you about one experience I had. Uh, I have done some classical uh, because I used to have a, a great friend in South Florida when I lived there uh, named Peter Yanellis that owned a remote truck, and sometimes I would get to go out with him. And uh, there was one occasion where I was recording in a church, a really big freaking church with, I think, one of the largest German pipe organs in America with a full orchestra of like 80 pieces and a hundred voice choir in the church. Mm. And I remember that we mic'd everything. I mean, like every pair of violins had a mic hanging over it. Um, the cellos wow. had, you know, like lavaliers wrapped in foam stuck in the F holes. Everything was close mic'd. And then we did, we took a Shep's stereo microphone, which is expensive. Back then in the 70s, they were like 34. Let me guess. The pair, stereo pair sounded the best. Yes, of, of course. course. It did. And that's what we did yeah. was we put it on a piece of like twine and hung it from the 100 foot high ceiling in fishing, the church. Fishing string. <laughs> no, it was actually like hemp twine. And I was wondering about the wisdom of putting a $3,400 mic, which today would be, you know, like a yeah. $10,000 mic or better. And we're like hoisting it up. And we'd stop it about every 10 feet and listen. And then we would A, B between that and the subgroup of all mm -hmm. the individual mics. The stereo mic just sounded better because it got the room. There was a sweet spot, but you know what? Rob's earlier advice about the piano from little distance, the, Mic selection and distance, babe. Yeah, uh, listen to it like it should be listened to. Let the mic be your ears. So there you, you go. know, yeah, there's some, you know, as far as recording live strings, it, you know, for pop sections, a pair of RCA 77s in the back is a beautiful thing. Um, because everybody's got those at home. Yeah, deck of tree is nice with 47s <laughs> up above the conductor and, yeah. you know, spot mics. But um, in terms of a, a strictly classical orchestral uh, recording, that's... Um, you know that those guys are real artists. They're really the guys who specialize in that are Do really you, something. You might not be old enough, being only thirty-six years old, right? Mm -hmm. um, but there used to be a guy named Rudy Van Gelder. Do you remember Rudy? The name? Mm -hmm. He would record jazz dates live, live two track directly to um, a lacquer. On oh yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the name of his label, but. Um, that's another guy who was a true artist in what he did and just captured what was going on in the room and man, those records were amazing. So yeah, Google him later, Rudy Van Gelder. Um, okay, Mike Shalata asks, Hi Rob, when recording instrumentals, I listened to the two or three examples given uh, to get an idea of the vibe needed, meaning taxi references, but the examples have lyrics with singing. What are some good patches to use my instrumentals as substitutes? Excuse me, I'm sure it depends on the genre, but maybe three or four examples for EDM, future bass, hip hop, etc. Um, I don't really understand the question. Do you? I, I think, think I do. But I'm not a programmer so much. But you know who who knows this stuff really well? So is this guy that I met through Taxi, James Koshin. You know James, of course. I, I just got invited to go to dinner with James and Jill when they're going to be in L.A. And I'm not invited? No, actually, uh, Deborah has been emailing <laughs> Jill, and she this? said, what about, Deborah's going to be out oh, of town. Thank God. But she said, what about the Shirelli's? It's so and, wrong. And they said, no, I don't think so. Yeah, of course. <laughs> no, actually. But he <laughs> knows. So hit him up on Taxi, you get a message board. He knows all of the latest stuff. Um you know, I know the Vengeance thing is popular and, um, you know, Nexus and stuff like that, but I don't know what the coolest, newest thing is in terms of uh, what programmers are using. And, and you know Shucks, what? I'm 0 for 2. I'm well, 1 for 3. And, and the target moves, like, every 90 days because some new record comes out with a cool sound and everybody goes, oh, got to have that sound. Yeah. Does um, change. I like this name. It's kind of alliterative. Christopher Christos asks, question one, would you list your top 10 most used plugins, non-native, and maybe a quick idea as to what or how you use them? 10 plugins, non-native plugins. Um, I love the Wave stuff. I can't tell you specifically which ones. I like the L2 a lot. I think that's a really nice plugin. I like the, the Waves uh, C4. I think that's pretty cool. Um, I like, um, I love the Slate stuff. I like their drum trigger. I think that's pretty cool. 
Um, they do a good job. I like all of my own plugins, of course. But um, and the final mix ones you're talking about. Yeah, I like um, I like soft tube stuff. I yeah. like their uh, CL1B plugin and the and their Pultec, and I like um, I like the Fairchild that Universal Audio has. I think that's pretty good. And you own a Fairchild, right? A real Fairchild. A real one too. Okay, so and just no, to, I don't. What what's the super? <laughs> uh, what do you have? The green one down by your left ankle in your room. I think. Oh, I have. Well, I have a. I have a CL1B which is blue, and I have uh, stay levels and 175A and stuff like that. I used to have a 436 pair of those. What you have one in particular? It was like a super rare, really awesome compressor. The 175 and the 175A and, and B. And made by Fairchild or who? No, that's uh, Universal Audio. Oh. 1956ish, something like that. That's not box. the one I'm thinking of. Was it a, like a dark green Yeah, it's just like... They, it, um, there was one that you had that was like... One that talking I, about the one that was like this big? It was that. I, can't remember, was I just remember there was one day, if you were sitting at, at your computer down by your... Between your knee and your ankle. Well, I moved everything. Oh, okay. Well, there was one down there, and I remember thinking, man, I've been in a lot of rooms in my life, but I've never seen one of those in real life. Huh. I don't know. I've got a lot of cool stuff, but uh, and how much of it do you use? All the time. Oh, you do all the time. I thought you only you you work totally in the box. No, no. Okay. No, what I'll do is I'll take something like um, if it's a vocal and I want to run it through a, you know, an eleven seventy six or something, I'll run it through the, the hardware and record it back in. I won't. I won't. Um, you know, in most cases, I'll. I'll tend to go to the hardware rather than the software plugin. They they just sound different to me. So those are so there's a handful of good plugins, you know. Um, my room, it's funny. Uh, this weekend, I spent like four hours walking down memory lane and looking at old consoles and stuff. And I was looking at a picture of my old room at Howie Schwartz, and I don't think I really fully appreciated at the time that I had like original 1176s in there and. LA2s and <laughs> and Pultex, you know, like real Pultex that had been redone with all original parts. Everything worked, nothing was glitchy. I don't think I... Hey, if you find anybody selling one of those cheap, I'll take it. I'll take it off the hands. <laughs> you know what I saw the other day is a picture of Synchro Sound, which is oh the God. studio we first or second worked together in Boston. The right. Whole, the studio the cars used to own. Yeah. And they had that old MCI board in there. A 600 series, which oh I thought God. was the worst sounding console ever i would have to agree next question well <laughs> one more thing about this so rob booked time for us to work on his project in a place called synchro sound that was owned by the band the cars and roy thomas baker was a famous engineer at the time famous producer mm -hmm. and do you remember his approach for uh, aligning the tape machines that they would mm -mm. do something crazy with the bias like they would over bias the machines by a hundred percent and that's how they got that sound go listen to the cars records and you'll see that they sound extremely unique and it was because of the way the tape machine was biased which, over bias under bias i mean knowing all of that stuff that you know that's old 300 school. nanowebs per meter squared and all that lovely stuff that we used to have to know yep <laughs> i mean plus five plus three plus six irrelevant now you know that was the art of it, and it, it did make a difference. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you know you can pick up an MCI 528C series console like the one that I had a triad recording for about five grand now? <laughs> now, give me the five grand, and I'm off the Cabo. I'm good without that. <laughs> Melvin Lindsay asks, "Hey Rob, I'm trying to improve my production workflow for doing a better job at meeting submission deadlines. Are there some tips you can recommend for folks like me that are still trying to get started with Taxi?" Hmm. How do you meet submission deadlines? Workflow, yeah. Um, One of the things I'm, I'm often asked about, what is your workflow? So here's the thing is, as you, what I've learned, at least for me and my partners, it seems to be working out pretty well, is, you know, finding out, you know, the, the first thing is, you know, what's, where, where's the guts of the song? You know, where's the money? You know, and that may be a simple track or the vocal, and that you have to have some flow, I think, which, which comes in time, trial and error, finding out what works for you, 
and then you know applying that over time and refining it and I think that my kids and everybody who's around me here they hear me say this every day or two if not more often and that is you know once you find something that's working you know pretty well for you improve upon it the next day and if you improve just one percent every day you'll be three times four times better at the end of the year and then once you feel like you have a handle on something those in music or or anything else really those you know those fundamental things apply to other things whether it's in music or life or or anywhere there are fundamental things that apply and improve improve every day you know really learn what the you know what your craft is right spend time really learning about it uh, my son loves to take take pictures and i keep telling him study lenses study focal length study aperture settings and, and really know that camera and the lens intimately and it's the same with creating a song or an arrangement you really have to dig in and once you start to do that I think in a simple way which now I'm getting to my point is if you can find a simple way to lay down that track then improve upon it every day in a year's time you're gonna be like that it's gonna come very quickly and you will apply what you've learned in that one way to bass guitar vocals every area will improve and then once that happens I think you're off to the races I hope that was relatively articulate I don't know uh, it was I'm a little worried that people will take that to mean that um, you know keep refining keep refining keep refining not yeah. the same song the process right don't keep refining the same song it, it, you know that's a great point for, I, don't get me yeah, wrong steer them away from perfectionism Oh my God, here's how I know a song is, when I know something's done, it's really, really simple. People have asked me this for years. Yeah. Do you remember my answer? No. I listened to it, and if I'm at the end of the song and I didn't really, nothing really bothered me, I might listen again in maybe another time or two, but that's it. Like, it's done. Once I feel like the song is saying what it's supposed to say, like I'm done, and I am not going to go crazy for a month on that kick drum sound. I'm not going to do it. Right. I'm going to make the decision. And the hardest discipline, you know, one of them for me was making a decision and committing to something and letting go of it and go on to the next thing and continue to improve every day. That's part of the process. Whether it's a song, an arrangement, you can come back and revisit things, which I've done. But I feel like you know, you can write one song for the rest of your life, and that does not mean it's going to be, you know, the right of spring or yeah. something. It doesn't, you know, you know, and don't think that the song you're writing is like your last song. Like, that's just the first in this journey of writing many songs, and just try to make each one better in some way. And, um, yeah, Taylor Swift, strangely... Uh, there was an exhibit that she had a few years ago at the Grammy Museum, which mm -hmm. everybody should go to. The one in L.A.? Yeah, everybody okay. should see the Grammy Museum. Um, and she was in the studio, and they were asking her, this was a couple of albums back, so maybe eh, four or five years, I suppose, what is she trying to do on this new album? It was a simple question. I could imagine her saying any number of things, but she said, I just want to make it better than the last one. And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to remember that. Like that simple idea, like write that song, do the best you can today, learn what you can, go to the next one. Engineer, produce it, mix it as best as you can, but try to improve a little that day. Like every day, that's my goal. I want to be a little bit better than yesterday. In every area and in no time, I think you make big progress. At least for me, it, it worked that way. So Works that way here? Yeah. Yeah. Um, People always ask me, you know, about the road rally, and my goal every year is to make it better. This than... one was incredible. Another grab me, listen, another high five, five moment. I was ball. But I that's all I do. I literally had the the ballroom stuff already done and, and scheduled, and then I just ripped it up one night, sitting here late, and went, I can do better than this, and I did. It was a a, a big mistake on a um, pressure thing for me, you know, and, and level. It, it just totally upended my schedule but in the end it worked out to be a better road rally than if I'd gone with the original schedule so yeah make it a little better a pitcher wants to improve every time you know a quarterback anybody you know a writer a poet 
Anybody? By the way, you're a football fan. Uh, I sure have you am. seen the the Joe Namath thing on HBO yet? The documentary about Joe Namath. I did see one a couple of years ago, two part, which was great. I don't know if it's the same one, but that it's was just really good. Simply called Namath, um, and it, it was amazingly good. So cool. anyway, just saying for those of you who like the football. Um, Didn't somebody have a second? Yeah, Christopher uh, Christopher Christos had a a second thing that I didn't ask. Would you recommend a good source to learn music theory necessary for a producer starting out with a minimal background? Play some instrumental nor form. Play some instruments, no formal training. So a good place to learn music theory that would be applicable for a producer. My first question would be, why do you want to know the theory? So no argument for me. <laughs> I went to college for a minute and I could talk, <laughs> you know, circles with music theory and, and that stuff. And I feel like, you know, what I would want to know for what, for what reason to communicate with musicians. So if I'm with a string section, I might want to know a way to communicate in musical terms. Um, if I'm writing a string arrangement or a horn arrangement, then I'll want to know, you know, what things to stay away from. Um, and I'd need to know the ranges of instruments and other things. But if I'm communicating with uh, musicians on a pop record, I'll sing the drum drum beat. I won't write it out. Right. You know, if it's a bass part, I might write the chord changes and give them an idea, but I'd do it just in the room with somebody. I'd say, you know, play it kind of like this, or maybe like McCartney would do it, or, or James Jameson, somebody. And But I've never really... Rarely have I had to do too much in turn unless it's with a, a, a like a classically trained musician. I may have to write down chords and stuff like that. So um, with that in mind, I would say whatever your instrument of choice is, get good lessons from somebody. And I think that in, in a short amount of time, you will find not only you'll be able to read music, you know, become accomplished at it, you'll be able to understand how to demonstrate chords and chord progressions and arrangements fairly soon. I don't think it takes a long time, but I don't know if I would, at least in my world, uh, the, the idea of music theory and that stuff is uh, doesn't, doesn't come up that much. But if I were to recommend a good college, I'd say Miami. <laughs> <laughs> a great music school. It does have a great music the school. The best. Um, Music theory. <laughs> you know, there's a big difference in the way the kids are coming up today in the industry versus the way they did, certainly back in my day, and you were kind of on the cusp of both of those periods. Um, so I'm the best of both worlds? You are. You're a <laughs> cuspy dude. Uh, back in my day, everybody worked in big studios, and they worked around other people. So I had the privilege and the honor of working with guys like Tom Dowd and Arif Martin, and I would hear them, I would watch them and see them say, you know what, you could get 10% more mood out of that bridge if you inverted that chord, played it like this. Mm -hmm. And they would walk out and go ding, 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 ding. Let's lose that note and just mm -hmm. give them two thirds of the chord, ding, ding, ding. And I'm constantly saying that. Leave the fifth out of the chord, or don't. It's the chord voicing is too bright. Right. Yeah. That's. But I can easily. I won't have to necessarily say. You know, play second inversion. Right. But people, you learn those tricks of the trade by being around other people, and now mm -hmm. everybody's isolated in a home studio, and, right. and basically they're learning from watching videos on YouTube, which are incredibly valuable. They're mm -hmm. going on. Um, Oh God, what's that place? Uh, gear sluts, which I think is questionable. There's some really smart, good people giving great answers, and other people that know the lingo that are professing to give good answers. But if you've got any experience, you look at them, scratch your head, and go, "Yeah, you know the big words, but not the the theory behind it." But mm -hmm. my point is that yeah, if you were you've always had assistants, and, and they mm -hmm. leave you better than when they arrived. I because hope so. They do. Um, and so that's the best thing you can do rather than they going... They end up, you know, chain smokers and <laughs> have, <laughs> that's having right. other issues. But musically, they should arrive, you know, leave better, yeah. They, they end up being addicted to Xanax. Just yes, to exactly. deal with the pressure. The but, pressure. But that's, that's the best thing you can do is find the best person within driving distance of you that you can work with and, and learn from them. 
Quincy Jones had a great quote, and it was something like, you know, work with the best talent that the world has to offer. And just by doing that, you know, a lot of things will reveal themselves. As a coach, when I used to coach, you know, uh, Little League, um, you know, the idea was to put yourself in a position with better players and better coaches and always try to again improve every day and if you do that then the things that you can pick up just by that you don't even know you're absorbing is yeah. incredibly important and valuable so it's not about how many times you fall down it's how many times you get up uh mm -hmm. john ashley asks has mixing and mastering changed due to streaming and mp3 download formats dominating the market that's a good question I think it is. I think that I think mixing is changing every day. And um, years ago, well, even recently, still is there's, there's the level wars that we talk about. And you want everything to be hot, but yet now uh, Spotify and Apple Tunes and stuff they will only allow certain average levels. So you know how a song is mastered and how compressed you want to make a file or mix is. You know we have to change. Um, the way we approach that based on, you know, the genre, the style of the music, the song, um, the times. I mean, in 2019, it's a lot different than 1999, right? So the 20 year difference is a huge, it's a different, completely different approach, I think. Although we're still trying to accomplish the same thing, which is to get the song or the piece to resonate with somebody. It's the vibe of it. Now some records I feel like maybe I've under compressed or over compressed or over EQ'd or under EQ'd and some things have worked really well despite my mistakes and others no matter how perfect I may have thought they were they didn't work. So I think if we're always trying to serve the song those things can tend to take care of themselves but I'm also not a fan of recording, engineering, mixing, and producing, and doing everything yourself. Like I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't Do really you like get that too singular, idea. and you don't see it objectively enough. I think so. I think that's a good way to put it. You know, when I um, produce something, I have, I usually have to have someone else around to like. Even if someone else is in the room, it makes me think differently. Mm -hmm. It's a weird thing, you know, if um. My guy Charlie over here recorded me last week, and he, uh, we recorded some bass and some guitar stuff. Whereas maybe if I was alone, it would have been a little bit different. The way you played it, or the, the way, way you, you know, engineered it. Or? I don't know. Just having another person around for some reason changes what's happening in the room. For me, it feels different. So if I'm engineering something, you know, if I'm producing something, I like someone else to engineer it. If I'm mixing something, I don't want to be really the producer. And and mastering stuff. I mean, geez, I mean, wouldn't it be nice to have some objective ears come in at some point? Like, yeah. isn't, I mean, I'm, and I enjoy the interaction. So, yeah. Yeah, I think that's... It comes down, but see, you're a seasoned professional that at some point in your career, you re you recognize the need to let go of the ego and, and do what was best for the project. It's not about being right. right. It's about creating the, the best product if you will the best piece of art right and it's in and in my younger days i thought i knew exactly what i wanted and how to get it and that was the answer and nobody knew better mm -hmm. you know it's just a bizarre thing you know and over the time i realized you know what a lot of those ideas were good but some of them weren't so good and sometimes you know the other guys in the room have incredibly good ideas and if and it's so easy to try them right so if you made a suggestion it takes a heck of a lot less time to just try it and see if it works. Mm -hmm. And many of those are surprising. I might not think initially they work, but they might trigger another idea. Right. And you know, it's it's much harder to 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 have that creative path on your own when all you're doing is bouncing things off yourself. Mm -hmm. And you can get in that vibe where man, you're in your own head and it's like you see, everything starts to sound good or everything starts to sound bad. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, that's the isolation factor I'm talking about. When it's just you, yeah. me, you, me, myself, and I. Yep. 
um, you, you're seeing, hearing everything through that echo chamber inside your head. Yeah, almost everyone that I work with, a strange thing happens. You know, at some point in our relationship, someone says, you know, how is my, how are my tracks? How do they sound? Or, and I'm like, they sound as as good as anything out there. Really? Yes, they sound as good as anything, and that's the God's honest truth. And you know, we all have these self doubts, um, <clears throat> but. If you were to mix a song, I'd be like, I'd probably be pulling my hair out saying, how did he get that? How did he do it? And maybe you listen to mine and you're like, damn, how did he do it? How did he get it? And you and you get in this, like, to me, it's a psychosis of everyone else's stuff sounds better. Oh, absolutely. You know, and you hear this stuff and it can, it can be crazy, but the objective ear says, you know what? No, it's, 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 it feels the right way and it's doing what it's supposed to do. And you know, I've never you had that anything out. go to vinyl, because back in my day, that's all there was. Well, maybe cassettes. Uh, and heard it back and thought that it sounded anywhere near as good as any of my compatriots out there in the industry. Their stuff always sounded better to me. And that's because yeah, we hear all the, all the little nits that right. nobody else would have seen as a nit. By the way, my um, favorite thing to this day of yours that I've heard is the Mark Ballas record. Listen to Tori Kelly though. Yeah? Well, listen, yeah, it's lovely right. stuff up there. Because <laughs> Mark Ballas Come on, man. wasn't that like 10 years ago? That's a while back. But sometimes I go back and listen to that. You know, I'll run into a news article about him in People Magazine or something online and, and go, oh That yeah. was a good record. Though. It was a great record. Yeah, we had a lot of fun doing that. You can feel it. Uh, you can literally feel the kind of cooperative energy that must have been in the room. Yep. Um, you had so much air and space in that record. It was. It didn't sound like today's records where everything was just balls to the wall. You know, it it was. Yeah, but sometimes balls to the wall is cool, man. Yeah, I'm it's sure, right. but it wasn't that kind of record. No, no, no. It was a different thing. Yeah, and I had a lot of you know. Um, influence in that so I could say yeah we don't need to smash it you know let's just uh, let's not overdo the production let's minimize it you know when we make those decisions along the line sometimes they work and, and we're happy and you know, sometimes you know we need to do better um, here's a question Okay, Jeremy Webster asks, thanks so much for taking the time, Rob. Your panels at the Road Rally were fantastic. Thank I've you. I've been using my notes daily. That's respectable. Excellent. Um, how early on in a mix are you throwing something on the mix bus? Uh, I'm often mixing into a limiter so that I can hear some of the saturation and compression while I'm making decisions. You know what? A lot of guys throughout the years, some guys... Um, like to mix with a compressor or something on the mix bus. I have never had a lot of success doing it that way. I, I don't know. I kind of know why. For me, it's like if I'm working on the lead vocal and it's hitting that, that compressor on the mix bus, um, or if I'm working on the drum sound, I'm, I'm hearing not only what I'm adjusting on the track, but it's also of being affected by the sound of the limiter on the on the mix so I tend to wait till all my balances all of the basic feel of the song is there and I'll do it three quarters of the way to the end when I start to there's two things that assistants have always noticed really quick about me is I wait till the near the end and when I start putting the something on the mix bus they know we're in the home stretch. And when I write down what the start time is and the end time bar numbers or something are, I usually write it on the console or in the comments of the master fader or something. And okay, we're getting ready to go home now. It's getting <laughs> close. So it's near the end. Do you usually. still need me to stop and pick up milk on my way home? <laughs> exactly. So I wait fairly long. I mean, it, and if you're not real, I suppose if you have a ton of experience and you know what that master fader uh, those effects might be doing to affect, you know, the drums if you're working on the drums or whatever the instrument is, then you probably can manage it a lot better than somebody new. I think the simplest approach is to, you know, listen to the whole song 
understand what you want to do with it and then you know attack a section listen again you know maybe listen to the bass solo it for a second make a couple of changes and then bounce back and forth and then not have the extra the idea well, you would not have the extra compression and EQ and stuff on the master fader because that's going to affect every single instrument and it may not be the right way to serve the piece. You know? uh, especially, yeah, like if you're trying to listen to a vocal and you've got a compressor across the mix bus, but other inputs are going to affect what that compressor is doing, depending like on where the attack is set. Let's say that you've got a hi-hat part and that's, you know, something that's got a lot of transients in it and it could be affecting the compressor so the vocal isn't the same as if it, you solo. It won't be the same. Right, so if you soloed the vocal yeah, right. with, with the, it's gonna do one thing. The minute you add the other stuff, it's totally different. Right, there are ways around that, but that's like way more complicated side chain stuff, et cetera, yeah. et cetera, but you're right. That's if the kick drum is, work. <laughs> right, so if the kick drum is hitting the mix bus compressor and you want to, and you know, you're listening to the, 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 the song, as a whole that every time that kick hits it might suck the vocal down just a tad with yeah. it so you might tend to ride that word I mean, now you're fighting against stuff that you really don't need to fight against and i think if it's done you know if you if you think about that musically that would be you know that'd be a difficult thing you know if every kick and snare um i worked on stokely's album a few years ago and and i did have um I did have a little too much compression on the mix bus and he could hear it like he would say every time the snare hits I hear a little something and wow. because he's a drummer and his ears are so I'm like yeah I know but it's you know I, damn I can't believe you're hearing that like it's so subtle but he heard it he was in tune with it and don't you know that he was a hundred percent right you know I needed to loosen up on that a little bit so those things can be a fight and I think maybe it's um I think it's probably safer and and would make a lot more sense to wait until the very end for that stuff and if it's not needed don't do it you know? I had an interesting observation about the um, um, mix bus compressor on the SSL mm -hmm. if you were to use um, the compressors the individual compressors on each channel um, which frankly they sounded pretty darn good and you could yeah. get away with that I mean they were a good default compressor to go to so Oh, yeah. The mix bus compressor on an SSL liked its cousins on the channel. Mm -hmm. The minute you introduced another compressor as your mix bus compressor, they, they reacted totally differently and the reverse would happen. So S I figured out that SSL's engineers must have designed them to work together, or at least while they were designing, they were working together. And in conjunction with each other, they behaved really well. The hmm. minute you changed one of the variables, they became unruly. Just an interesting. observation. Hmm. Yeah. What's Chris uh, Jones have to say? He says, it'd be so cool if Rob could let us into his process when mixing the Highfields. Oh. Nate Highfield. What had, makes you think I even like those guys? I, you know. I love those guys. <laughs> Nate Highfield's been quoted on the huge difference that Rob's mixes make to their super successful sync tracks. Um, well, he is. He's, that's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, First of all, I can tell you as a, a close friend of Rob's, he does love the Highfields, has tremendous respect for him and uh, Both for of them, them. 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 And um, mm -hmm. boy, what, I, what a great relationship. It, it's a joy for me to watch you with them because that's worked out so well. And a lot of times relationships sour or creative differences get in the way and you guys seem to just- You know, knock wood every day, get yep. better every day. But that's the goal. Again, we want to get better every day. Yeah, and the um, relationships that I have with many other people in my, you know, um, career and life have so, been, you know, I've been blessed that way. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, um, go ahead, cut me uh, off anytime. Have you had to adjust your thinking, your approach to mixing when you're mixing for Nate and Kaylee because um, it's a, a mix for sync versus a mix for radio or records? Or do you approach? generally no no see it's an interesting thing and I I like that this gives me an opportunity to give you maybe two different sides of things so in the case of the high fields they are more Nate um, tends to be when I first met him I've known him a little longer than Kaylee but he's really um, indie 
uh, influenced. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really come from that world. So when I first started working with them, I would say I made maybe a, took a, a little bit more pop approach. And over time, maybe that influenced them a little, but I think more so they influenced me. Mm -hmm. Because in the way that they work, it made me think differently. And I've used the things that I've learned from them. You know, it goes both ways, clearly. But I've used that, those ideas in other records that I've worked on. So I think the question is, you know, insight into the process of mixing them. When we first work together, there's this period of feeling like what each person's sensibilities are. So if you're the artist, I have to think about what you're trying to, what you're going for. And then my, my job as a mixer or producer or whatever my role may be is to try to bring out the best, right? And make that, uh, make it all work. And over time, if I actually set my mind on that one idea like okay when Kaylee sings she has a certain approach like how can I get the most out of that if I think about that then every day I'm gonna get a little bit closer to maybe what she had in her mind's eye vocally or, or uh, performance wise and, and if Nate's singing maybe a little bit different or if it's a Kirk Franklin record maybe a little bit different if it's you know Stevie Wonder or somebody, it's a completely different approach, but the idea is to look at every project individually and see how, what, you know, bring whatever I can to the table and make it as good as it can be. So I would imagine by this, how many years have you worked with Nate and Kaylee? Like I met Nate in 2006 and Kaylee just a few few years later. So he originally signed to my production company with his band. We, we did a, an album together, so, which I did a horrible job on, frankly. You know, I, I wish I did better. It's one of those things where, like, shucks, you know, I wish I, <laughs> I did a little better on that one. But he was great, and we've been friends ever since. And then he met, you know, Kaylee, who was incredible. And, and you know, we, um, we compliment one another pretty, pretty well, I think, you know. Going back to the indie sensibility um a lot of the work you've been doing for the last few years has been in the Christian market. Um, Kirk Franklin's record being probably the single biggest success of, of all those in that is on the charts for some ungodly amount of time. Um, no pun intended. And uh, those records are very polished and pop. Um, or Some are. Or mm -hmm. gospel influenced. Um, they don't sound very indie, at least the ones I've listened to. I can't say I've listened to everything that you've worked on. But are you able to bring those pop or the um, indie sensibilities over to those records? I don't know that. Um, in that case, I'm sure there's a natural some amount that naturally, you know, sort of trickles over. But in the case of Kirk Franklin, I mean, he's just a brilliant guy. He knows. I mean, I don't. He hears stuff that. You know, I don't even know where to begin, right? And and I think he has in his mind, um, I don't want to speak for him, but my guess is he wants everything to be, you know, incredible vocals. He uses the world-class musicians, you know. His pursuit of excellence is second to none, mm -hmm. right? And he wants it to be an engineering and a mixing marvel. Like, he just wants everything to be as good as it possibly can be. And, you know, my short time with him, I believe he's. It's, it falls in line with maybe his spiritual beliefs that everything he does is to glorify God and to make the music the way it is, and that's that's, you know, amazing. And and that's a particular approach that he has, which I admire incredibly. Right? I've never seen you this happy as a person. Because of the people you work with, exactly. Since you've started working with all, I exactly. mean, you talk about what a pleasure it is versus pulling your hair out, getting 132 notes on a single mix. You know, it's, well, it took me. You know, I guess that comes with. Um, you know, we wisdom comes with age. You know, I suppose, and being 36 years old. I was going to say, man, yeah, you're way you know, smarter than you were at 35. It's a life's <laughs> endeavor, you know, to work with good people, and it makes it so much more enjoyable. And I work that much harder, and and I like it that much more, and it's just, um, I didn't say it was easy, it's been a long journey, 
but yeah, everybody I work with, I just I love them to death, and I just I just want to do so well for everybody, you know. But in terms of the musician, I mean, the musical elements of of indie and stuff, as you get to know one another, you kind of you kind of know what to take and what to give and what to when to make a suggestion or when to like maybe not say anything and and allow things to unfold naturally. I mean, there's an art to that too, right? So, um, you know, if, whether it's, if Nate and Kaylee sent me a song and I had a comment, I would certainly tell them. And if they think that I did something wrong, they would tell me. And it's not an ego thing. It's like we're trying to get the best out of the music. And I think if, but not everybody's like that. Some people have a different agenda, you know, they want a particular thing. But for us, I think we just want to do the best for the music and serve the song. And, um, and you know, and I think if, you know, when we when we get to get, when we first started our business together, our company, um, it one of the one of the main things that we all agreed on is I'll bring whatever I can to the table. If you need me to play bass, I'll play. If you need me to do guitar, I'll play. If if Kaylee needs to sing or Nate or whatever we all need to do like the idea is it's all for one and one for all right and it's a difficult thing you know if people aren't like-minded and I think the simple question um, there's a bigger answer which is what we're getting into which I love about mixing them it's not just about the mixing you know mm -hmm. it's about the journey that we're on together when they first started they didn't really have the right equipment I made some recommendations we you know, we'd talk about what we think kind of sound we want to develop, and this has been like this growing experience together. And it's like that, I think, with any great relationship, whether it's, uh, you know, your wife or your, you know, partner or, um, you know, um, artists. It's all, it's all part of the same thing. You kind of figure it out together, and when you have those kind of relationships, I think that's when you, when you start to do really good things, you know. Anyway, yep. that's really I, wild, wild, roundabout answer. But I, I get it. Maybe it'll make sense to somebody and they'll be like, yeah, you know, good people work hard, improve every day, you know, figure the stuff <laughs> out. I mean, that's, it's not, it's hard, but it's not complicated. And the journey in itself, like the steps are like, get better every day, set your mind to be coming excellent. And then, <coughs> you know, just, it's a grind. It, it really is. And I, it's not the glamour. Our part of the business is not all the parties. Like, we're the guys till four in the morning, you know, working in the yep. studio. Everybody else has gone out for the nice dinner. And you know, and we're like, working. oh, my God, you know. <laughs> you know, so it's, you got to love it and, and really put the time and energy into trying to improve every day and surround yourself with, with good people. And, you know, you met my friend Bill years ago. And that I, bill? Yeah, that bill. So, you know, you don't know this. Or maybe I said it on Taxi TV, but when I moved to L.A. Garside. Garside, very good. Yeah, so um, Bill, um, when I moved to L.A., everybody told me I'm, I was going to fail at everything. I mean, you know, of course, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail. You know, you hear that enough in your life, you start believing it. But, you know, I got the, the, the energy out to come out here. And, and the only person really that said anything positive was Bill. And he said, um, if you meet good people, you'll be all right. And I didn't understand the wisdom of that. <laughs> How's know? he doing? He's doing great. Yeah, he's Send doing him great. my best. I will. But there's wisdom in that line. You know, if you meet good people, you're going to be fine. You know, because well, they'll look out for you. Good people attract good people. We, you know, but it, it, but it doesn't come easy either. Yeah. I mean, you know, it takes effort too. You know, you know, I've, you've seen me getting mad. You know what happens? You know, when <laughs> you know all the time, it's, it's difficult when you work the hours and the, you know, and and you're trying to get something that just seems like just out of reach it's it's hard it's hard to you know be happy and all that all the time it's you know it's, it's part of it we've seen each other at our worst mm, i still love you yeah <laughs> um, and i just noticed i don't think my sweatshirt has the hurricanes thing on the collar i'm bummed out I'll get another one. I can't wait to get home and check it out. <laughs> All right. So then, what you're saying is mine is cooler than I yours. think yours might be. Um, okay. Uh, you have questions that people have been <laughs> she's shaking her head. Yes. Bring We're rambling. Up. We're rambling over here. That's okay. You know what? That's what makes us together on the show special is we're having the conversation and they get to pick and choose what they want to keep out of it. That's fine. Yeah. And don't forget this, by the way. So the code is, let's oh, just yeah. get this right so everybody can see this. It's l uppercase B, lowercase N, uppercase 
X. I'm rotating because it's lowercase on an, I. It's on an angle. Seven big V lower X three slow G Y uppercase U small Z uppercase N low A big seven lowercase B. Everybody got that? Was that randomly generated? I'm just by kidding. A I'm just joking. That's not the code. Don't don't do that. It's just a little <laughs> joke. That's a little joke. Should we tell them where to go? Yeah. All right. So absolutely. The code is really just taxi 2019. So there's the code. That's all it is. T A X I 2019. It's not this one. That was. Is it case sensitive, by the way? It is. <laughs> okay. All caps. All caps. You can't go wrong. You can't make it any easier than that. And uh, so here it is. Go to that website and get your mastering plug-in. It's really cool. I, it's just released today. How's oh, really? That? Yep. Yep. No. Yeah. So you'll be the first. Hope you like it. Okay. Cool. We will. Put Good that till up Friday again. at midnight. This coming Friday. Yeah. Okay. So you have like Which five is, days to do it. What's Friday? Uh, ooh. It is. Eighteenth. Yeah. Would you do me a favor? And go tell Deb if she's still here to make sure that she calls my dad because it's getting late there. Yeah. It's very important. It really is. Uh, thank okay. you. Okay. What do we got? Panning. Okay. Uh, here. Uh, well, Bree is doing that. Okay. Are you a 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock guy or anywhere that sounds right on the spectrum? Anything that sounds right. Yeah, that's, that's generally the rule of thumb. But let me tell you what. What I think sounds right is a pan knob can be basically a switch, left, center, right. As far as I'm concerned, if there was a switch and nothing in between, I'd be totally fine with it. There used to be consoles that had those. I know. I'm with you. You'd hit the and the But yeah, we're good. I mean, left, center, right. I do not spend a ton of time like, oh my God, is it like 1 o'clock and 11 o'clock or should it be 10 o'clock and 2 o'clock or 9 and 3? Like, no, it's left and right. Um, are you a fan of cross panning for balance? And I will give you an example of what I mean by that. That um, if you have, uh, let's say, a chicken picking guitar part, mm -hmm. and you pan that far left, mm -hmm. um, my instinct used to be that I needed something to reciprocate on the right to keep balance. Otherwise, your head would constantly pull to the left when you're listening to the mix. And I was never sure if that was me listening with an engineer's ears or if the public would do that. But I always tried to find something to, to balance that part with. Are you a, a, yep, I'm a reciprocal you. balance guy? I think so, yeah. I'm with you. And it doesn't have to be another chicken picking part. It no, just it could, could be, be something, something that, yeah, yeah. okay. Um, bass, I'm assuming you pan down the middle. We're gonna do a little pan thing here because I wrote some pan questions. Yeah, bass is usually the... down the middle. Yeah, okay. there's occasions where there's a stereo bass and stuff, but yeah, it's up the middle. Um, drums, uh, and I wanted to make a distinction. Um, organic, natural, real live drums versus electronic drums. Um, mm -hmm. Do you pan those differently or is everything panned the same? Well, when I have an acoustic drum kit, I tend to play that pan. Um, well, here's a, big, a bigger global answer, but it's short. So an acoustic drum kit, I'll pan it from the perspective of the player because the player is really playing a kit and it's so a the, snare and toms and everything and kind of in front of them. And that's the way the drummer hears it. A so piano the, player. The floor tom is on the right. That, yeah. If okay. it's the lefty drummer, I'd do it the opposite. Right? So, and if it's a piano player, it's from the pianist's perspective. So if, if, it's, an, if it's an instrument, I pan it from the player's perspective. But if it's an ensemble, like a string quartet, I'd pan it from the audience's perspective. Okay. So if it's a strict string quartet where there's a you know, violin, second violin, viola, cello, then it would be violin on the left, cello, and the cello on the right. Ensemble. If it's an orchestra, it's an ensemble. If it's a drum kit, it's just an instrument, so I play it from from the musicians. Uh, I always seat. did the same thing, and I had so many people Maybe I learned it from you. That could uh, be very why, well. Yeah, maybe, but why do, you know, people used to say to me, why is the floor tom over there? Because that's what the drummer would hear. Yeah, and it's uh, cool, too. I mean, sometimes I do wacky stuff, and it's cool. That's all right. Um... Electric guitar, uh, what's your kind of, do you have default positions if you're doing an organic sounding record and you've got an electric guitar part, where does your first electric guitar part typically go? The main, you know, if there's a main part, it starts in the middle and then if, as I hear the song and see what's happening, then I might, I might move it. I, again, like, it's generally going to be left, center, or right. It's very rarely am I like... 
doing that ten and ten two, two thing. Yeah, I don't I, do a It's lot hard of to hear, frankly. Um, ten and two, unless the instrument is something really dynamic or really pointy in the EQ. You know, it's yeah. It there are exceptions, but but like if you were to look at my mixes, you'd say, "Wow, it's, it's hard left and that's hard right." So is that. So is that. So is that. Sounds great. Okay. You know? Yeah. <laughs> okay, could it be better if it was, you know, 80% and 20% or something? I, I don't think so, you know, I really don't. I spent a lot of time, you know, messing with that stuff. And there are times when it does make a difference if you're laying a choir. There are exceptions to every rule. Yeah, yeah. but just basically, like, I'm not going to spend an hour with that. Like, I'm going to spend an hour writing the vocal. I used to record my middle tom, if there were three toms on a kit, by assigning it to both, I had drums left and drums right, or toms left and toms right, mm -hmm. and I would take the center tom, let's say it was on uh, tracks five and six where my drums left and drums right, and I would take the center tom and assign it to both. So it showed up down the middle because that's where it would be on the kit. And people are like, dude, I can't believe you're not giving it its own track. Uh, people are get so used to But that's to old school. You had a 24 track to record <laughs> on a 16. And you know what? I'll tell you, um, was it this thing, this one tape changed my life. In a, in, in a really remarkable way. Believe it or not, um, so my buddy De Derek Nakamoto, who, who does Panels of Taxi now, he's great. If anybody hasn't seen him, he's, he's great incredible. Guy. Really smart. So we did a, um, we had, years ago, we had to, um, you know, bring up an old Paul Anka song. Um, and it was, uh, it was, it was, I think, an eight track. And what they had is like a kick, a snare, and everything else on two channels. Mm. And then there was the bass track, and then there was like a, a, a Wurlitzer, and then there was the lead vocal printed with reverb, and then there was maybe the female vocal, and maybe a string quartet or something on a mono track. And, you know, this was probably in the late 90s. And at that time, it's SSL, and we have, you know, 100 channels in the console. And I put those eight faders up, and that thing sounded unbelievable. And it occurred to me that they made a decision. The engineer made a decision. The kick drum is going to sound this way, mm -hmm. basically. And the snare is going to sound this way. And here's the balance between the drums and the overheads. And it's going to sit on these two tracks because he had no other choice. And it made me realize that, you know what? Commit to something. Commit and, and live with it. You know, make the best decision you can in the moment and don't, I don't think you always have to wait till the 23rd hour of the day, 57th minute, 59th minute, 59th second but to it, commit to something. It seems like everybody does now because there are infinite tracks. You can always print it and decide about yeah, it later. Give the guy yeah. the option. I don't mind having the options because I'll mute it and I'll make the decisions. But, but that was a big lesson to, to realize that, you know what, people actually had to think it through and they made a choice. And they lived with it. And then, you know what, if it needs to be brighter, maybe they, they brightened it up a little bit later or something. But, but I think there's a lot to say uh, that can be said about committing to something when you feel like it's right, you know? Yeah. I read an article in about 1989 about um, Hugh Padgham when he was recording, um, excuse me, Phil Collins. And he, there was a mono keyboard track that he recorded with a delay, like a 50 millisecond delay, and panned one left and one right. And he had committed that with other stuff to a stereo track. And I thought, you know, why would he do that? You know, why would he print the effects? And I said, because then it just occurred to me, because they liked them. Yeah. You know, fine. And, they, and it sounds amazing, right? So, and they may have had limited outboard, even though Hugh Padgham right. probably didn't because he was a pretty big deal. But mm hmm yeah, he. I mean, he's one of the the best ever, right? And Phil Collins. What are you going to say? They, they liked it and they let they committed to it. Yeah, it's a lot to be said for that. So, anyway, um, I okay. just answered four more questions. Yeah, a couple more uh, <laughs> quick panning things, and then we're going to move on to the questions that Bria's been collecting. Um, how do you pan your delays? From do you have a do you? Again, let's go to a chicken picking guitar part, just because it's easy to imagine it. Um, do you go out of, you know, like tape machine out or track out into the delay unit and then to another channel? Or would you put it on a, a send and send like a mono send of the delay and split to a stereo or no rules? You just do what's right in the moment. There are a couple. I do have a few rules of thumb. Okay. Um, I always use stereo sends in Pro Tools. 
um, and if I get a track from a producer or somebody, I'll convert those. Mo Let's say he gives me a send. They have something on bus one and it feeds a stereo delay. I'll make it bus one and two. I'll do that because I like the where the track, let's say the vocal is panned, here we go. Again, with the panning, this is good, this is good. <laughs> you, my friend. So if the guitar is panned left, maybe I want it to feed the left delay, or maybe I want it to reverse, and then I'll just re reverse the panning on the return of the delays. And so I like to use stereo sends, and the delays get returned on an aux channel. Does that answer the question? Or yeah, it does. And I was okay. going to ask, um, yeah, like... SSLs and consoles of that era had uh, dedicated returns. Yeah. Um, and or you can bring them in a fade, up in a fade. Right. right. So I, I think today, maybe I'm wrong, I don't know, but today I think more people tend to use a, a pair of faders or a stereo fader mm -hmm. um, because they have more control. They, um, Although now, I mean, I don't think the returns on the SSLs I was using in the 80s were actually... Well, there's the bucket up in the middle, so you right. can put, you know, Q left right and then four returns or six returns and then on the right you know whatever empty faders you could you could bring stuff but they weren't automated like uh you know nowadays all faders are, are moving faders sure. are automated back then mm -hmm. the returns where you could bring it up to match the level what did they call that on ssls where you would see everything little colors you turn the knob and it go pink you're back at your original oh when you're doing the total recall total recall <laughs> thank you influenced by uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger um, yeah so I like to you know everything comes back on an aux there are times when I want to put an effect on a channel directly yeah but if you do rides on a channel you know when you ride the, the lead vocal if you put a reverb on it you're also riding the reverb and and if you have to do anything drastic you can hear those you can hear the reverb moving it doesn't sound right um, how often do you use pre versus post on, on reverb or effects in general? 99% it's post. Mm -hmm. I've never understood why people made such a big deal and they even put pre on consoles because every time I try to... That's it, for uh, Q mixes though, right? It, yeah, so you well, don't want to send... Yeah. And, and sometimes it's good for an effect. You want to... Right, so you could... You want to make something swim in reverb and hear yeah, more you, of the reverb than the actual instrument that's driving. Yeah, so you, yeah. yeah, if it's pre, then you take down the fader and all you hear is the reverb, and that's cool. Well, I've done that a bunch, too. It's, it's not the normal thing. It's just, that's usually the exception. All right, let's have some questions from Bria. All right, um, Greg Vaughn asked, regarding the first question, I record on a Yamaha uh, G C3 Grand. Okay. I feel the current sound is a more mellow piano sound than mine. How can I best EQ it? I got a return that said it was too bright. Okay, so he's got, uh, this is regarding the first question, which Rob answered. Well, the Yamaha C3 is great. Yeah, so that's like a real piano. What kind of mics are they? Uh, Earthworks. And they say it's too bright. Oh, no, this is, is this, who's this from? This is Greg Vaughn. He's just Oh, it's not the guy Robert Ells. It. Okay. No, he's just asking to build on it. Okay, so he got a comment from a taxi screener that his stuff was too bright, even though he was using a real um, grand piano. Mm -hmm. And uh, if something yeah. is too bright, I will tend to just change the position of the mics or change the mic selection. If you get if that's not an option, then See, the thing is, is EQ has a sound, and with acoustic instruments, it's, it's it can be tricky, right? So if you start boosting 2K or 3K, and maybe you're putting 3 or 4 dB on it, I mean, that can get fatiguing if the mics are also bright, right? So you're layering a bright-sounding mic, maybe, that are over the hammers, which might make it even brighter because you're going to hear the attack. Now you're going to add a little more EQ to it, and then if you have something on the master fader because you want it to sound like a pop record that is even brighter, you know, yeah. it's all of this stuff. Um, I would say less is more. You know, just try repositioning the microphones first. The first thing, 100% of the time, is mic is 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 the instrument which you've got covered, right? So. Nobody wants to hear me sing. You want to hear Paul McCartney sing, right? So given who's the better instrument? Well, clearly he is. So once you get that solved, so you're, you're C3, 
that instrument is solved. So now what's the next thing? The microphone. So that's the next choice. If you get a great microphone, if you have a pair of great mics, you should be able to position them correctly and get a great piano. So don't you think? I have a theory what's, what's about the theory? this guy's thing. Uh, assuming that he's got great mics uh -huh. and he clearly has a great piano. Like he does because he says U87 and 414. Yeah, 414. Yeah, I mean, those are both great piano mics. So those yeah, those are great. So they should not be too bright if you're placing them but in the you right know what, what, position. Think about this. What makes great microphones sound overly bright with no EQ? Is this a multiple choice? Nope. There's only one right answer. <laughs> and I'm clearly going to fail this one. Thanks so much. Phase, okay, for phase, yeah. phase problems. Could be phase problems. Because yeah, I see a lot true. of people make that mistake when, when they... Especially might. on a piano. Right, exactly. Yeah. They'll, they'll put them in there and they do this. Where... Uh, there we go. And they do that and they don't realize that... The, <laughs> <laughs> that the mics... You want to be, what's the rule, twice as far away from each other as the distance from the mic to the sound source, I think, is the... Yeah, greater than. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I've seen people try and do an MS or an XY over a pair of piano strings, but they don't think about where it is relative to the sound source, and that's where they blow it. So when you get phase problems, the bottom end will cancel, and what you get is overly bright. Just a theory. But yeah, I, I would work on the position of the mics. That would be the next thing. And before I touched an EQ, I and we just cut piano. What day did we do it, Charlie? On um, Wednesday. Last Wednesday. And, um, you know, I listened to the piano. Uh, and when I, I sat down, I hit a chord. I listened to I said, this is a beautiful piano, right? So I put the mics on it. We had two stereo pairs, one on the outside. And I didn't know if we wanted to go mellow or bright. So and I listened to them and... I immediately noticed that, like, you know what, too much hammers. Mm -hmm. like it's, it's raised them just a little bit, problem solved. I mean, four uh, inches might make a world of difference. It depends on, on the, the octave the song is in. It depends mm -hmm. on the part. You know, it depends on the player, as you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if you want to sound like Elton John, get the mics close. And there's no point in having one mic way down on the bottom end strings and another one way up on the top end strings if everything is being played in a middle octave and close yeah i'd start right up right in the dead center of the piano with an xy maybe and then like move from there give it you know six inches and eight inches and and if that doesn't give you the sound that you want then you know maybe separate them a little bit or raise them a touch more and, and listen do they have... You'll spend more time trying to EQ out a problem than you'll, you know, you spend way less time just Moving adjusting the, mic. the microphones. And, and once you get them set for your instrument, you, you know, it'll be, it'll, be, it'll be awesome. Do they have a mono button in well, Pro Tools? Um, not, in the, not in the actual DAW unless it's a plug-in, which, yeah, well, you can just put a mono... Uh, because that's a, the greatest test in the world. I mean, most consoles have a mono button, most mm -hmm. real consoles. And if you're recording something in stereo and you want to hear if you've got phase problems going on, just hit the mono button. And if 30 to 70% of your sound goes away, you've got a phase problem. Yeah. Move, move the mics. And spend some time. It's, in a couple of hours, you'll have it down. Yep. And you'll know, and then you, you know won't what? make that mistake again. And you won't make it. And then you know what? The next time you want to record the piano, you're going to remember. Oh, it got brighter when it was closer. Or it got warmer when it was further away. And then you'll have that knowledge. And the next piano thing you record will be just a little bit better. And keep doing that every day. This See? guy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This guy. Every day, five fifteen. He's got a BMW M4 series with these like tuner mufflers on. It's a brand new car. It drives me nuts. I'm gunning for you, buddy. Listen to that crap. <laughs> All right. They can't hear that. Yeah, they could. I've well, you've got a you've got a high quality microphone here. I do. What are we getting? Anything else? <laughs> yes, we do. Bria, hit it. Um, Neil McTavish asks. Oh, I know that guy. <laughs> do you ever compress vocals on the way in? I do. Uh, I will say that. You know, mostly I don't I, I don't like to compress or EQ most things on the way in, um, but I do like to uh, compress vocals. But I don't like to mash them. What I don't like to over compress them. There's a lot of good compressors for vocals. So I mean, a typical chain would include you know a nice preamp, um, 
LA3 is one of my favorite compressors. 1176 is another great one. LA2 is a great one. TubeTech CL1B is a great compressor. And, um, you know, uh, I just wouldn't overdo it on the way in. A lot of singers um, don't like to hear the compression. They don't like to hear it because it gives them less, um, they feel like they have less um, natural control. I once had somebody describe. <laughs> I would, would normally set like an LA3 just to, you know, like keep them from, um, mm. you know, like keep out any nasty peaks and put just a little hint of reverb on there just to make it a little sexier. And somebody I was working with once said to me, can you take the condom off of my vocal? Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> hey, you know, that's another story entirely. Entirely. But, yeah, so <laughs> I do like to compress. And I'll tell you what is I did a, a this year's seminar we did um, on... The, you know, it was like recording stuff you need to know. We started by giving all the answers, and we had a little PowerPoint thing that Charlie put together, and then we took questions. And um, one of the things that I'm a big, 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 big fan of is getting it into Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase, getting it into the system the right way. Now, what I mean is I am not a fan of... of it doesn't mean you can't do it, but but if you have a choice, like a good microphone, a good preamp, and a good compressor, when you're doing that vocal, get it in the right way using hardware. And then let the software go to work when you want to um, treat the sound. I like that idea. Not just because it's sonically better, but it's a different workflow. If you have a good uh, preamp at the front, it changes the way you work. And you won't know that until you try it. So anybody out there, you know, Ron Harris, who, who has a different workflow than me, right? So he likes to use the Universal Audio Apollo mm -hmm. duo, duo or something, which they make great stuff, and but, but it's a software-based system. I like a microphone, a preamp, a compressor, bam, into Pro Tools and it changes your workflow and it changes I think the um, in my experience like there's a different connection between the player or the singer and what they're hearing it's 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 hard to describe but it's different uh, let's here's something you and I have never spoken about all these years of doing taxi TV together brace yourself mm -hmm. selves mm -hmm. plural mm -hmm. uh, favorite headphones to give to singers when they're recording <laughs> you know what you got me on that one. My daughter has a particular set that she likes, and that they work for her. Open a lot of clothes here. Um, closed, and most um, most singers that I work with usually have their own. Mm. They bring their own if they're going to do a vocal session. People ever use in ears? I've never had anybody do it, but I'm sure it's done. I went through a period in the late 70s, like 79, 80, 81. People started using those Yamaha open ear mm -hmm. foamy ones. And, and I hated those from an engineer's perspective. They leaked like the bleed, crazy. Yeah. Just uh, really, really, really hard to work with. And when they would move their head, I mean, you, were, you were constantly chasing a good sound because of the bleed you get mm -hmm. from those headphones. So I'm, I'm, I think that period of open ear headphones is, is past us now. Yeah, yeah, I mean, nobody's really complained in years over the headphones. If, you know, if, if they pick up whatever's in the room, it's usually pretty good. I mean, I They're also heard. way better um, headphone mixers. Again, oh yeah, the, back the, in the my headphone day, systems it, are so good now. Yeah. It, you know, back in the Jurassic period, it was basically the engineer in the control room. The was Jurassic the one. <laughs> It was, man. It's like everything <laughs> fell on our shoulders. Um, yeah. You know, they couldn't adjust anything. I remember when somebody came out with like a, a four-channel mixer for headphones. That was a big revelation. Wow, I can adjust like the bass and drums louder now, or my vocal can go loud. Well, now with digital stuff, you can have 128 different headphone mixes yeah. if you so choose. It's, Mine's it's all right. Next question, please. Um, Michael Sayer asks, what are the first few pieces of outboard gear you'd buy if you didn't have any? Preamp, then compressor? 
What are the first few pieces of outboard gear you would buy? Good question. Get a Neve 1073. Get an a or an Avalon 737 SP. Now these this are, is all hardware stuff, or you're talking? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, so if you attended my Taxi Road Rally seminar, <laughs> had you done that, you would have this answer. So everything is what is the budget. So I like to say when I recommend stuff to people, I try to keep it under a grand. Okay, per now, item. Per item, you know. So, so. If you want to know what preamp, I'll give you a few. A Neve 1073 uh, BAE makes the best um, clone, but it's not a clone. It's actually the exact design. They're incredible. All the parts and stuff. Yeah, and oh yeah. Match all the caps same, and everything. Wow. Same everything. I think they're the only ones in the planet that can actually do it, and, and it's spot on, man. Incredible. Um, and um, Avalon 737, which has a compressor and EQ and the whole thing. But that's, you know, we're talking about three things. Those are probably 2500 bucks. But it's got a great preamp, a great compressor, and a great EQ all built in. I've got a, a question about um, outboard gear or, or actual gear. Which washer and dryer mm -hmm. did you and your lovely wife buy? Because Deb and I went... I had no I went, idea. <laughs> I went and looked at washers and dryers last night. I almost fell out of a... I, mean, I cannot believe how unbelievably expensive they've become. Yeah, you know, I said to my wife, we don't need... We know what we need. We don't need to spend a couple of grand on washers and dryers. What we need is another piece of outboard gear for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I went to that place near our home's uh, warehouse discount center, whatever it is, on Canwood Street. Yeah, you'd have to ask her that stuff. Well, in our no family, idea. I do all the appliance shopping. Recently got my wife a an instant pot, and uh, she said, "Here you go, honey. That's yours." <laughs> nice. Anyway, uh, yeah, washers and dryers. I mean, you can drop twenty five hundred bucks on a washing machine, and I just can't imagine it does anything that much better than a three hundred dollar one. Anyway, uh, next question, please. Um, uh, I won't even read the name. Bria is so shaken up by that last question. <laughs> Just starting to use GarageBand to record my songs. What's a good way to learn how to use a DAW? What is a good way? Is it a person, a gentleman, or a lady? It's just their username is just a bunch of letters. Oh, username with a no bunch idea. of letters. Uh, mysterious. Anyway, their question is, I'm just learning how to use GarageBand, which comes with every Macintosh computer. Um, what's the best way to learn how to use a DAW? YouTube. Next question. There you go. Uh, Pierre Ven Venio asks, uh, any success recording killer vocals with an SM58? Uh, no. Okay, next question. Well, let me put it a different way. <laughs> if someone like Pink, okay, recorded on an SM58, it would be a killer vocal, right? Yep. So, um, from that standpoint, it's the singer, and it's the melody, and it's the lyrics. Like, that's really... I'll tell you what else. Let me scratch that because that was too flippant and too quick. So, so if it's Pink, you're going to get a great vocal. I just mixed uh, an album. His name is Jonathan McReynolds, okay? Great gospel artist. I love this guy like you wouldn't believe. And he did it. It's a live show, and he used an SM58, I think. Mm-hmm. So I had to make it sound good. And, and you know what? For all the imperfections of the microphone, the guy's voice is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It's just like, what? I forget that it's maybe not sonically perfect, but I have never bought a record because it's sonically perfect. And neither has anybody else in the history of music, other than maybe some jazzers or jazz lovers. Yeah, let me see. So the guy that buys that sonic perfect record the songs all suck, but it's a perfect sound, right? right? Like nobody buys that record. Like it's so it's okay. But I think that again, if we're trying to get excellence in in a studio setting, you know, we want to get I think a good microphone, a good preamp, you know, and use the best equipment that we can afford to get. Um, but in a live setting, it's a little bit different. He's out and he's doing a show. You can't deal with you know. You have to have feedback, you know, considerations and. And that dictates the mic selection. Yeah. And and if you get a great performance on an SM58 and a mediocre performance on 
a fifteen thousand dollar Neumann U forty seven. Like take the SM fifty eight incredible performance every day. Yep. Like take the performance over the sound a hundred percent of the time. We've talked about this on previous episodes when we were together where yep. you take a, a ninety nine dollar drum kit and put Steve Gadd on it, it's gonna sound way better than putting me on, you know, a, a ten thousand dollar yeah. Yamaha studio kit. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and the funny thing is, 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 if, is, is these are the things that we sort of learn, maybe learn over time. You know, I could uh, imagine very easily that Steve Gadd sitting at a, a um, you know, a, a very inexpensive drum kit would, you know, his playing and his feel and his approach to the instrument would, I would imagine, change based on, you know, the, the tone and the sound of the drums and other things. And, um, and it would ultimately end up being really, really good. Like there'd be something very musical there. And but if you take someone, you know, maybe who can't sing or play so well, you know, and hasn't quite gotten to the level of Steve Gadd because so few people have, then you put them on a great drum kit. Eh. So what if the snare sounds good? Yeah. So garbage what if in, kicks, garbage out. You know, it's yeah. I mean, that's why we practice eight hours a day to get better, and that's why, you know. We spend so much time pursuing the excellence of of the art, right? And um, when we when we put that kind of time on the songwriting and the production and all of those things, we want to make sure a good microphone is there to you know to record it. People want faster results today because everything can be found in a you know nanosecond on Google, and I think that that's has spilled over into learning how to play an instrument, learning how to engineer, learning how to produce, learning how to do everything. It's like what can I do, you know, yeah. to, to get the quick result? And, and I admit, when I buy a new product and there's a quick start guide or the manual, I always go to the quick start guide and I probably never read the full manual. It's like, yeah, give, but, you know, if you can get through it, you don't have to read every word of the manual, but you, but you still have to put time in to understand what it is that you're working with, right? This is great video. Again, I say this to my kids all, you know, not all the time, but I used to say this, you know, I'm a Patriots fan and Tom Brady, there was a commercial with him in Under Armour or somebody, you know, that he sponsored and you would see the repetition, you know, on the first frame and the first few seconds and then you'd see him repeating it the next day and the next day and over and over and over and over and over again and the dedication and the time, whether it's, you know, um, you know, Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady or, you know, um, any great successful person puts those hours in and they always want to become the best that they're capable of being and they put those the time in in order to achieve that and they also want the best equipment to work on mm -hmm. whether it's an athlete or a car driver or a race car driver wants the very best of everything on his on his car right so we're the same you know we want the best the best microphones and and we want it to bring out the best in us and but we may not Tiger Woods, let's talk golf for a second, because that's a great analogy. Um, put a thousand dollar set of clubs in my hand, and I don't know that I would play any better with a five or ten thousand dollar set of golf clubs in my hands, because I suck as a golfer. Um, yeah, but the, the converse would be, you know, the Tiger Woods with a thousand dollar, you know, every Joe, every day Joe set of clubs would would do really well. So you kind of have to earn your way up to some types of equipment. Um, yeah, sure. That's fine. That's fair. But it all works together. It all yeah. works together. And the same. The concept is the same. I mean, you can't expect to go buy a, you know, just because you buy a twenty thousand dollar microphone doesn't mean you can hit the notes. And it doesn't mean that you're. That's exactly right. Um, <laughs> yeah. From an engineering perspective, same thing. You've don't heard you, me sing. You go. <laughs> I'm one of the few. <laughs> so yeah, it doesn't have to matter. Sign what a non-disclosure agreement. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So yeah, the point is, is I can go buy a you know three hundred thousand dollar nineteen fifty nine Les Paul, and I can play the guitar, but I'm not going to sound like Jeff Beck, and I'm not going to sound like Eric Clapton. I'm going to sound like me. Yeah. You know, but if you put Eric on my guitar, I think he's going to sound like Eric. You know. We have time for one more because we're at five thirty one. All right. Um, Christopher Jacobs asks. Uh, do producers ever look for new sounds or material? It seems that most posts on Taxi are just looking for new copies of the examples. Ah. Can writers be successful writing and sending in fresh stuff? Absolutely. I mean, it is an endless struggle. <laughs> 
in I'm an dying to hear your an answer on this. endless pursuit to find something fresh and new. Always want new stuff and fresh ideas. And you know who comes up with the new stuff and the fresh ideas? These young kids, you know. They have different ways of figuring it out. They have a fresh approach. And you know what? I am, I am not a guy that lives in the past. Like, I love the music of today. I love what I'm hearing. And I love it when I hear something fresh and new. I am not trying to go back to 1984. Van Halen or 1965 you know I just I I think the best songs are on around the bend I think they're coming and I think every year I hear something that's like fresh and interesting and new and last year one of them was um was a massive smash uh Havana you know I heard that mm -hmm. song and I thought oh my lord god how they get away with this one man this is so interesting and cool What's the song that's the kid song that's the it's had like a trillion plays or a billion um Baby Shark. Yeah, <laughs> Bree is going, "Oh god." Okay, I so, I, yeah. I don't disagree with what you're saying, but there's a caveat which is we it all, has to fit in a framework. It has to be for pop or well, yeah. Because we get taxi members that say, you guys never forward anything outside of the box. Well, there's outside of the, good outside of the box, and there's less than good outside of the box. Just because it's different doesn't mean it's great different. Um, it, it's got to right. be viable so that people want to hear it a second time, or a third time, or a hundred times. It still has to have all of the, the meat and bones. You know, it has to be a great melody. You know, when something different comes out you know what immediately comes to mind is you know um, when I was about three Nirvana came out <laughs> right so when Nirvana came out you know all the oh, hair I'm doing the math yeah <laughs> right okay. so the Nirvana came out there was like all of a sudden all the hair bands that wore the spandex and the glam stuff like that was like all of a sudden like couldn't like sell a ticket yeah right so in and, and that came Thank on God. like it went like but but it's but it was crazy and I still remember people living in the past like not hearing that those songs were really good like and they the way they did it was fresh and new and cool right and when the beatles came out people not you know the kids got it but the review of the beatles if you can dig it up was like yeah some nice harmonies but this kind of music may be on the way out or something like that it was it was a bizarre thing to to read like in hindsight you know, you can't predict the future, but if it's done well, the Beatles did it, the Stones, and everyone had their own little, I think, um, approach and their own little way of, of, of contributing something new. And, and when we get that, you know, a lot of people tend to get excited about it, you know. I think Taylor Swift came out with some really groundbreaking stuff a few years ago, and I, I feel like that merge of country and pop was... It was really, and it's changed music quite a bit. But I can go on and on and on. I can list, you know, Bruno Mars. They all have one thing in common. Structure. Structure, yeah. It, uh, yeah. It, that's that's what I, I want the people watching mm -hmm. the show to understand is the caveat, is that just because you're doing something really outside doesn't mean that it's digestible by the public. Um, so what do these groundbreaking acts all have in common is their stuff all has basically a pop song structure too. it's well written yeah it's it's produced well it's mixed well and it's got a big hook it's got a lyric that resonates it's i was got gonna a say it book. resonates with the listener it's yeah. got a vibe like at the end of the day if you listen to louie louie by the kingsman right we all know that record i think they cost 50 bucks to record it perhaps probably in the mid 60s <laughs> And it's distorted, and, and is all you can't understand his words, and, <coughs> and it's the most beautiful thing, you know. And then if you listen to Tequila, right, the Champs, and and that song, if you listen to that record, sure you can be snobby about it and say, oh, they didn't do this right, or they this note's flat. Like we can get into that stuff, and like yeah. And if you fixed all that, you'd have killed the record. Yeah. You know, and they're just kill. They're timeless classics. A lot of that Motown stuff, if you listen to the harmonies, oh some, you know, they're out of tune. Things are out of tune. They let it go because it felt good, you know. It's not that they didn't hear it. I mean, these guys, you know, certainly knew what they were doing. But on whole, you know, they took the vibe. And that's the key. 
uh, you asked me a few days ago about our uh, mutual friend from back in the day, Gary Rosen, mm -hmm. and he worked at a place in West Orange, New Jersey called a House of Something, uh, a studio where Cool and the Gang recorded, and um, they recorded the song Celebration there. And at one point, Gary gave me, I believe it was a 24-track copy. Oh, I'd love to hear that. Of Celebration, and uh, on, on, you know, two inch. And I had it at my studio in Fort Lauderdale, and I brought up each track individually, and I was sitting there going, There's, was this Dolby encoded? And I'm playing it back unencoded. It sounded like crap. I mean, and I knew the engineer on the record. He was, a, you know, a smart guy and a great engineer, but each individual instrument sounded like just terrible, like something was wrong. I remember asking my assistant, did you, did you align the tape machine? Did you do this? Did you do that? Something sounds wrong. And then I just shoved all the faders up to zero, and yeah. it sounded like the record. Sounded amazing. Yeah. I did a thing some years ago, a few years ago, with the Sergeant Pepper. I brought the Masters, right? And right. we played Paul's vocal, and it's distorted, and it's unbelievable. You know, you listen to the guitar tone, and it's like, oh, yeah. I'd, I'd immediately filter out all that mm. stuff, and then I'd immediately, like, tune this note. Or, you know, and then you, but then when you put that together, and you put the four, it was a four track, if four faders up, you listen, and, and, like, that is ungodly good. Yeah. It is beyond belief how good it is but if we start looking at every little sliver you know that's not what we're really doing there's there's a moment there's time that we can and should look at each piece but it's the it's the body of work that we're looking at it's the overall song and the listener he's not analyzing that stuff he or no. she he's just listening how does it make me feel how's it making me feel and if that thing is going to you know, if when I heard, you know, as many songs, but, you know, if I hear a great song, jeez, I got to go buy that. I got to go find that song and then, you know, find it on the radio, Shazam it, you know, and, and then, uh, and I think it's very much the same, whether it's in the sync world where you send something and it's just got a vibe, you know, there's maybe the vocals out of tune a little bit. That's part of the charm. Maybe that's what makes it feel intimate mm -hmm. instead of perfect, right? So those are those... Th it's the combination of those things, I think, that, you know, makes this business, you know, and the creation of the music, you know, challenging and elusive at times. It's difficult, but um, but when you, coming back to my earlier comments, so when I'm at the end of the song and I'm mixing it, okay, if it's not perfect, if it feels great, you know, if it really feels great, then the thing is done. Do you ever mix without automation and, and literally play the faders like an instrument? No, not like we used to do in the old days. No. <laughs> Again, I hate to keep going back to the Jurassic period, but yeah, for me... No, there's usually some, some movement or some automation that, that, that is necessary. I didn't have that in the first... Well, seven, that's a different ski probably, and I still will like ride a fader or ride a preamp to tape, right? So you right. probably did that too. That's a lost art. And that is a different sound than moving automation. Yeah. How hard you hit a compressor on the way in or how hard you hit a preamp changes the entire tone of the vocal. I had a great assistant engineer named Paul Kaminsky, who I just found out recently passed away. R.I.P. Paul. Sorry, he was awesome. Best mm. assistant ever. And I, I, he could read my mind, but just to make sure he got it, if I was working on a mix, and I would say, and coming up on the downbeat in the chorus, we'd be standing next to each other at the console, and I'd say, downbeat of the chorus, guitar two, up a quarter inch. And that's how we mixed back then. <laughs> we literally played it like an instrument, and it was fun. And you either it had was a, fun. a great performance or a mediocre performance. But if it was a great performance with flaws, we'd just keep it, put a leader on each end of it, call it a day, because it was great. Right. I love that stuff. When you, when you get the magic, you got to know it. And yeah. That's a hard thing to know. And then you try to perfect it until it's ruined. <laughs> yeah. and, you know, you can, I, mean, I've, I mean, you know, I'm saying this because... You know, I don't want to come off like a guy that knows it all. I'm saying because, you know, I've made those mistakes, and I maybe probably continue today to make those mistakes where I'll do a little too much or maybe a little not enough. And, you know, these are the balances that we struggle with and the things that every day we're, you know, we're trying to figure out. You're doing something right because you got two Grammys, dude, and uh -huh. a lot of gold and platinum that you don't bother to hang on your walls. <laughs> um, why don't you show the code one more time because we're running well over now. We are 11 minutes over. There okay, you go. Everything's kind of bad. Let me see and if I can do that. Which plugin is it? It's the mastering plugin right on top. Right on top of the... Uh, 
Yeah. The, the list of plugins. The list of plugins. You'll see it. It's cool. It's really cool. It's really cool. I've got to say, and I'm not saying this because I could just not say it, but I've seen so many places on our forum where people talk about that they've gotten some of your plugins and they can't believe that they're so cheap, <laughs> that they think they're underpriced, that they sound so good, they're easy to use, and the results. You know what? There's nothing more satisfying than you know, hitting a button and turning a knob and having it where you go, oh, that sounds better. And apparently, that's what your stuff does. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to make it easy. And part of most of the plugins that I have, it's because maybe there's two or three things I use on a chain. Mm -hmm. And I just like get sick of putting through two or three plugins. So I have my guy design it with them all in one little thing. And I turn the knob and it generally works. It gets me halfway there. Wow. So... Yeah, they're easy. Oh, they're good. I hope you, you like them. Thank you for coming by on the day after your birthday. Thanks, um, Lasco. <laughs> thanks, Rob. Rob. Good to see you, man. Great to see yeah. you. Sunday, matinee. All right. Uh, we should try and do that. Uh, have you guys seen the movie The Green Book? Because we want to go see it. Charlie likes it. Charlie's giving a big thumbs up over there. Are we going to light uh, this thing? We lit it already, but we can light it again. Come on, man. Where are the matches? There's the matches. So that's one way you can you can play the music. You can give the outro music. You can do a little... Oh, did I already blow it out? I did. Yeah. I'll take another wish. Okay. Go ahead. Uh, hit the music. Cue where music. is the music? Oh. Isn't that your music? Just cue the music. There it is. We will see... <laughs> See you guys next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Whoa, where's the, my audience? There's the audience. Bye, you guys. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. All right. Anybody want a piece of cake?